So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Bill Silva, and I'm the Associate Executive Director at the Connecticut Association of Schools and also the Director of the CAS Center for Leadership and Innovation. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our breakout session today, supporting transgender students through equity and inclusion. This topic is critically important as we dive deep to explore how we can work together to learn and lead for systemic racial and social justice, the topic of our Equity Summit today. Thank you so much for attending this session, for all our sessions today, and uh, thank you for joining us. I wanna begin by recognizing and thanking our partners uh, in presenting the summit, the Connecticut State Department of Education and CERC. Uh, thank them for their generous support in making today's Equity Summit possible. A uh, couple of reminders, uh, everyone's muted. Uh, our presenters will leave uh, some time at the end of their presentation for questions, but feel free to use the Q&A to uh, keep track of your questions during the presentation, uh, but we will have some time at the end uh, to address them. Uh, you may use the chat to let us know if you're experiencing any technical problems, and we'll be monitoring the chat uh, through the presentation as well. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the CAS website. Uh, you'll receive a notification email, anyone who registered will, and uh, that uh, probably will be a few days from today when all of the sessions are available. Please feel free to share this and all of the summit sessions with your colleagues. Our hope is that you will find them useful for professional learning within your school community during the coming school year. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenters uh, for this session to you. First, Dr. Glenn Lungarini is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Association of Schools and the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference, CAS CIAC. Uh, Dr. Lungarini's been a teacher, coach, principal, and brings a wealth of experience and expertise to his position and has been working on this topic uh, directly as a student, uh, as a scholar, uh, and as an involved participant for quite a while. Uh, Dr. Lungarini is joined by uh, Mr. Peter Murphy, uh, Esquire, an attorney with the Connecticut law firm of Shipman and Goodwin, and also by uh, Andrea Yearwood, former Connecticut high school student and student athlete, and currently a student at North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Um, and I will now turn it over to, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silva. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, first, for the, you know, the equity uh, summit piece that we had this morning and uh, the messages from Secretary Cardona, as well as our wonderful uh, keynote speakers and, and students this morning. We hope to continue to build on that for you this afternoon. You know, when we consider diversity, equity, and inclusion, we can't just stop at the piece of talking about uh, racial diversity with, with minority students. We have to look deeper into that uh, with gender. We have to look into that uh, with students of need as well, because if we don't consider those um, uh, communities and, and demographics at the same time that we are now, you know, finally uh, making meaningful change and action uh, in the areas of, of racial social justice, then we're just going to repeat those same injustices with those other communities. And, and that's why we felt so important uh, of bringing this piece today to you to talk about uh, gender equity as well as the racial social uh, justice that we have. Again, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to be able to share with you the expertise uh, from our legal counsel and, and uh, Peter Murphy from a partner with Shipman and Goodwin. And there is not a better person in the country uh, that we can interact and engage with in terms of the context of experiencing and understanding uh, racial and social justice, particularly from a Connecticut perspective uh, as, a, as a student, former student, then Andrea and also from the uh, perspective of uh, gender identity and uh, you know, really being on the forefront and an advocate for uh, transgender female athletes. And, and that is, uh, you know, we are fortunate to have Andrea with us as well today. So uh, again, as, as we talk about this today, uh, please you know, don't hesitate to ask us questions. 
uh, you, you have some people here that uh, certainly can share with you personal experiences that I don't think others can. I want to start this uh, th this morning session here uh, in just kind of giving you a little bit of backdrop. So, you know, why is Connecticut um, situated to be able to talk about this? And, and just for a, a brief few moments, um, I'm going to talk just a little bit uh, athletics just to give you context, and then we're going to shift uh, very much into general K-12 to uh, policies and understanding and looking at uh, the LGBTQ plus community, particularly looking at transgender, uh, black and brown youth and looking at the challenges that that they face. Uh, but to, um, you know, give you a little bit of, of context, uh, let me share my screen and I'm going to give you uh, real quick. Okay, so, you know, again, to, uh, to, to put in context for you, uh, what we're experiencing, um, we want to understand how legislation over the past year has taken significant steps in anti-transgender uh, laws. And to show you the, the influence of that, we have a little Last clip. Last year, the year the lawsuit was filed, 25 bills were introduced to restrict trans youth access to sports teams, bathrooms, and locker rooms. This year, there are over 60 bills. Okay, and, and when we're talking about, when they start that video and talk about the lawsuit, what they're referencing is uh, the federal lawsuit that was uh, brought against the CIAC uh, that challenged our inclusive transgender participation policy. And, and this is not a concept that, uh, that, that is new. I think, you know, again, if, if we go, uh, go back and look at uh, over time from educators, um, you know, there was always the, the perception, the concern that you know, those who are not involved in education that are setting standards, um, you know, may put education in a very difficult setting. In 2021, eight bills have been enacted into law that ban transgender female athletes in grades K through 12. Uh, 69 bills were introduced in 2021 that aim to prohibit transgender youth from participating on sports teams. 15 bills sought to prohibit individual access to restrooms consistent with their gender identity. And all of these bills, uh, whether it was restrooms, whether it was uh, access to certain opportunities, they all cited uh, an unfair advantage that biological females uh, have, uh, biological males have over biological females. Uh, however, there's little research that includes adolescent transgender uh, female youth, and as such, most of those bills cite expert opinions on uh, adolescent transgenders that are assumptions based on uh, data from non-transgender uh, athletes and uh, students. So throughout this, lawmakers and all of these bills use athletics and cite a perception that transgender females dominate or will dominate female sports. The Fairness in Women's Sports Act. But when lawmakers were asked why they are proposing these bills. But do you have any specific complaints um, regarding trans athlete women in Florida where they've had a quote competitive disadvantage or a safety uh, problem? I have not. I don't know of any personally in, in Tennessee. At this point, no. No, I'm not aware. Instead, supporters cited one case over and over. But I go back to the example um, in the video in Connecticut with Selena Soul. I'm talking about Georgia. I understand that, but with Connecticut. In Connecticut. In Connecticut. In Connecticut. So what actually happened in Connecticut? The fairness. Okay, so what actually happened in Connecticut? So again, just to set the stage for you, when we look at over the, the past uh, four years, uh, and this is, you know, where Andrea and uh, Terry were, um, you know, primarily running in uh, in events, and we look at the 14 uh, state open sprint events that Terry and Andrea ran in. Uh, here is, are the facts and the actual data behind it. Um, Terry and Andrea had five first place finishes, uh, finishes, two second place, two third place, and four fourth to ten place rankings in that time. When you look at the percentage of non transgender uh, females winning, a uh, biological females, uh, cisgender females winning, again, 64%, second and third place, 85%, and then fourth and 10th place on 94%. So the reason I share that with you is it's critically important for us to educate ourselves 
on what the facts are, because oftentimes, you know, much as when we're dealing with racial social injustices, and you know, there's a lot of conversation and talk now uh, about uh, critical race and critical theory teaching, and, th and again, educating ourselves and having knowledge on exactly what it is we're talking about and what it's being referenced is what is going to empower us the most to make good decisions and make decisions that are going to help support our LGBTQ students. So when we think about what our responsibilities are, we have to look at inclusionary state and federal law and have an understanding of what exists. Connecticut has two laws that address gender identity and expression. The first is this general statute, which addresses sex and gender identity by prohibiting discrimination, segregation, or separation on account of sex, gender identity, or expression. The second Connecticut law that addresses gender identity is General Statute 46A-5121. Here we identify uh, gender identity as a person's gender-related identity, appearance, or behavior, whether or not that gender-related identity, appearance, or behavior is different from the traditionally associated with the person's physiology or assigned sex at birth. Under this general statute, gender-related identity can be shown by any evidence that the gender-related identity is sincerely held, part of a person's core identity, or not being asserted for an improper purpose. In January of 2021, uh, uh, President Biden issued this executive order on the prevention and combating of discrimination based on gender identity. Again, when you look specific within the, uh, the, the context of this executive order, he highlights that children should be able to learn without worrying about whether they will be denied access to a restroom, locker room, or school sports of their choice. And then there was a specific case in Bostick versus Clayton County uh, that I believe um, Attorney Murphy will get into a little bit later that was a significant uh, piece of Title VII um, law that came out of the uh, Supreme Court in 2020. In June of 2021, there was a notice of interpretation that was issued uh, by the Acting Assistant Secretary of uh, Civil Rights with respect to uh, how the Title IX uh, addresses discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Within that, in 2020, uh, 2021 Notice of Interpretation, the department uh, interprets that Title IX's prohibition on discrimination on the basis of sex encompasses discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Also within that interpretation, it was cited that the U.S. Department of Education will fully enforce Title IX to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity and education programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance from the department. For us in particularly, and for other athletic associations, as we were looking at our lawsuit, you know, this means we have to consider that high school interscholastic athletics are education-based programs and activities that extend to member school curricular and seek to instill the school's mission. So when we look at extracurricular activities, as well as our curricular activities, we have to um, take into account and, and put into enforcement those same practices and policies uh, that we have in place throughout the school day. So let me just uh, give you a little bit of uh, background about that, uh, this Gloucester County case of the school board versus Grimm in, in 2021. Again, this is an important piece that will highlight for you some things that we need to think about when uh, considering diversity, equity, and inclusion of our LGBTQ youth and community. This legal case began when plaintiff Gavin Grimm filed a lawsuit against the Gloucester County School Board in Virginia for a policy that excluded students from using restrooms consistent with their gender identity. Grimm argued his right to use restrooms was consistent with his ide gender identity was protected under the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution and Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Initially, the Virginia District Court ruled that Gloucester County School Board's restroom policy violated Title IX and the Equal Protection Clause. In its decision, the District Court supported Grimm's position that it was discriminatory to prohibit use of restrooms consistent with his gender identity. 
This case was appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. The Virginia District Court's ruling was affirmed by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. The Gloucester County School Board then appealed the U.S. Fourth Court of Appeals ruling to the United States Supreme Court. On June 28, 2021, the United States Supreme Court turned away school board's appeal of the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling. This is not the first transgender bathroom and locker room appeal that the U.S. Supreme Court has turned away. In December, the U.S. Supreme Court was asked to consider a case in Oregon, where a school district policy prohibited transgender students from using facilities aligned with their gender identity. Ultimately, the high court also turned that case away. While significant in its potential impact, the Fourth Circuit ruling does not set a national legal precedent, as its application only applies to the states within the Fourth Circuit's jurisdiction. Those five states are Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, some of which recently enacted laws prohibiting transgender athletes from participating on teams consistent with their gender identity. As such, we see the stage has been set for future legal challenges against anti-transgender participation laws. When we consider how our transgender youth and LGBTQ youth are affected from a social, emotional, and health standpoint, we, we need to understand some of the column, common feelings that our black and brown students uh, may be experiencing uh, around their interactions within our school communities. Again, the more we can educate ourselves to what our students are feeling, the better we can address their needs. So, you know, again, looking at the percentage of youth that have uh, LGBTQ youth that have experienced discrimination based on their orientation or gender, it's not surprising to hear that LGBTQ um, youth and particularly transgender African-American youth are among the highest percentage uh, of at-risk students for teen suicide. So some of the, these are some of the common feelings that our Black LGBTQ youth face. You know, when, when we're looking at grief, you, you may experience sorrow because of, you know, senseless uh, uh, deaths or in, including um, the violence that we've seen against trans women over uh, many years, but this grief is, isn't simply about recent events. Again, it's compounded over time, which we heard about uh, in discussions in the last session with our uh, student, uh, student voices. Also, many of our LGBTQ youth and, and uh, black and brown students feel that sense of helplessness where there might be you know, nothing that, that we can do but we wanna emphasize that many people are feeling this way and we have to be open and candid uh, about being able to uh, feel vulnerable and find ways that we can address this. We also have to understand and accept that because of the long history of systemic racism, that people may feel a sense of hopelessness and that we have to be able to address this throughout the country in a way that we can support students and drive more equitable opportunities for our kids. We also have to understand that, you know, that, that our, our black and brown students and our particular LGBTQ students may feel a little distance from uh, white allies. And again, this is a place where we need to build those relationships and continue to provide areas of support for our kids. You know, oftentimes our kids experience things on social media that uh, really is, is still a disconnect for people of our generation. We don't always, you know, have that same experiences uh, that, that our kids uh, that we're dealing with in our schools have on social medias. And, and this can create uh, a sense of, of, of rage and feeling of rage within, uh, within our students. So this rage could be direct towards individuals or institutions. And, you know, again, I think, you know, in just a few moments when we speak with Andre, she might be able to share with you some of her experiences through social media and, uh, you know, what she encountered through that. You know, all these things, again, can point towards experiences that, you know, create a desire for people to escape. You know, we hear a lot of people talking about um, trying to, you know, leave communities or think about, uh, you know, ex experiences that just become unbearable. And, and that's what we're trying to bridge the gap from. And again, that fear that you may be experiencing, 
you know, something that's scary right now. It, it's a little bit, we're trying to break out of the norm. And when we break out of the norm, uh, again, we, we often have fear of things that we don't understand. So we need to have uh, that understanding to, to overcome that. Uh, and in doing so, we can prevent that numbness of feeling that, you know, they're, they're, it's not okay to have these intense emotions. We need to be able to, to have that support for our students. Another area that we can really work is empowering our LGBTQ youth. You know, it's my belief that our success is, is not going to be measured uh, by, by wins and losses or by grades on a report card, but rather in the number of meaningful relationships we develop along our educational journey and the contributions we make towards the personal gain to provide a better tomorrow for those who come after us. You know, it, it may be fair to state this could be a challenge for all of us. You know, giving ourselves permission to feel without self-judgment is always a challenge, whether it's a lack of space, time, or priority. We seldom take necessary moments to process our own emotions. When we think about the skill sets that we need to, to manage our way through uh, these changes, because of the lack of time and priority we set to manage our own emotions, it's easy to uh, experience an intensity to what we are feeling. We need to arm ourselves with the tools to de-escalate the intensity of our emotions in any given moment and schedule emotional health time to fully process our own mental health needs. We also have to be actionable in, in what we do and finding active involvement and in LGBTQ plus support can help students in these communities to diminish negative emotions. Often helping others has a positive impact on enhancing our own positive emotions. And as with everything we strive to do in education, we need to empower our students and we need to provide with them supports. Identify and make visible safe spaces where black and brown LGBTQ plus students can find support within their schools and communities, as well as national services. The research identifies gaps between um, males and females. And until we've, we really address the social and cultural uh, inequities and the cultural acceptance and opportunities that exist, we're not gonna be able to fully close the gap between our transgender and non-transgender students. Transgender youth who are, are forced to engage in opportunities that don't align with their gender identity often drop out of those experiences. High school is a time when all students are finding themselves. They're discovering their passions and searching for their future pathways. As educational leaders, we support students in discovering their career goals, stress and coping strategies, healthy relationships, extracurricular aspirations, and many other aspects of youth development. Keep in mind, the majority of our high school students are minors and under the age of 18. In all Board of Education policies and in academic to athletic student handbooks, education leaders stress and enforce substance prevention. Uh, prevention. Yet out of an anecdotal fear that transgender athletes may dominate high school sports, we stray from our research-based understanding and consider requiring minor students to take physiological life-changing hormones to access an education-based opportunity. Or in some cases, we deny them access to gender-affirming activities and require participation on sex assigned at birth, despite the well-documented harms that could potentially come from such policies. In the research that I've done, you know, our literature reviews have shown that there is a lack of standardized policies regarding transgender individuals. And if agencies across states and organizations can work together to streamline those policies and procedures, we can implement less volatile more and more consistent policies for, that support our LGBTQ plus students. COVID has exasperated the previously present social and emotional health crisis that plagues our schools. Um, extracurricular activities and experiences of our students are, are things that we must consider in order to help and enhance the physical, social, emotional, cognitive, and mental well-being for all kids, especially our transgender youth. To do this, we can help our kids by checking in with our Black LGBTQ youth. In addressing the opportunity disparity between minority and non-minority students, we need to evaluate and provide systems that overtly support minority youth, including Black and Brown LGBTQ plus students. The Pre Trevor Project 2021 eloquently stated, 
While it may be difficult to translate your complex thoughts and feelings, it's okay to use your platform to speak out against racism and racial violence. Your feelings and experiences are valid and can help educate others about current events. However, it is also important to know when to let others speak and when to raise others' voices. We often fear that which we do not understand. Educating ourselves and each other about LGBTQ plus students, particularly the transgender community, is an action we can all take. As was pointed out on the onset of the presentation, what is vocalized by those who strive to maintain discriminatory practices may produce ill-informed decision-making. 69 anti-transgender laws were produced across the country in 2021, many of which wrongly cited transgender female domination and Connecticut interscholastic athletics. Educating ourselves, our emotions, and educating ourselves helps our emotions and helps prevent us from repeating the history of marginalizing minority student opportunities. We address social media a little bit, and it's okay to take a break. And again, just a moment, we will talk with Andrea uh, Yearwood, and her firsthand experiences will help you understand the importance of allowing yourself to take a break from social media and check in with your own emotions to manage your mental health. And then learn the difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy has the power to bring people together, connecting them over difficult emotions. Sympathy, while recognizing, recognizing hardships is others' experiences, can drive disconnection. Uh, and again, that, that um, definition comes from the Trevor Project 2021, which is a great resource for people who are seeking to find ways that they can support uh, Black and Brown transgender youth. Our transgender policies are often legislated rather than uh, based on actual facts and purposes of activities in which students engage. In education, this transcends the athletic arena as transgender policy also affects the instructional setting. Under the U.S. Department of Education's June 2021 Notice of Interpretation, OCR will fully enforce Title IX to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity and education programs and activities that receive financial federal assistance from the department. In school settings, we need to be aware of how policies can influence other students. Understanding and implementing inclusive LGBTQ policies and procedures is a civil rights issue within our educational settings as well as our communities. The voice of LGBTQ individuals must be listened to and respected for our society to grow in understanding of this marginalized community. As educators, we must lead by example on valuing emotions of all stakeholders while building toward consensus to effectively resolve conflicts and create supportive and inclusive learning environments. To accomplish the goal of creating a more inclusive primary and secondary school learning experience, we must continue to analyze the foundation for current practices and then be open to implementing new understandings that develop from integrating the critical convergent and divergent thinking of others. We cannot let the fear of unknown or perceptions of what could be distract decision makers from using data to design inclusive student-centered learning environments that meet the cognitive, social, emotional, physical, and mental well-being needs of all our students. The topic of LGBTQ rights, especially transgender female athletes' rights under Title IX evoke contentious and convicting viewpoints. Powerful learning communities embrace diversity and support stakeholders in developing self-efficacy as well as personal and professional capacity. Enacting meaningful change around racial social justice requires an understanding of others' perspectives and a willingness to modify current practices, develop a stronger educational community. Likewise, if educators do not integrate inclusive practices for LGBTQ students, we are doomed to repeat the same civil and social injustices with that marginalized community as we have with other minority students and stakeholders. Embracing each learner's and colleague's unique differences and accepting the value of diverse cultures will be the strength of, of education's future supportive and inclusive learning culture and climate, including our K-12 Connecticut schools. So with that, I'm gonna turn now to a little conversation with Andrea. Again, Andrea is a former Connecticut high school track athlete. She graduated in 2020. She is currently attending North Carolina Central University where she's majoring in Spanish and minoring in political science. Uh, being that there are so few high school transgender athletes in our country, this is a unique opportunity for you to hear firsthand experiences from Andrea herself. 
Andrea, thank you so much for, for joining us. And you know, as we turn and start the conversation with you, let's start first in just talking about your experiences as an African-American student, uh, K-12 in, in Connecticut and growing up. And you know, you've had a very supportive environment, I think, you know, through our conversations, but talk to us about you, your peers, and you know, any example you might have where you you saw opportunity limited to you as a person of race versus, you know, maybe your um, other students? Yeah, um, some of your correct, some, yes, most of my experience has been pretty supportive. However, I think that more when it came to like, I think like within the school and around my peers, there was a lot of opportunity kind of for me to, I guess, kind of relate to those around me because again, I did go to Cromwell High School, which is a predominantly white high school. And so a lot of my time there had felt kind of isolated just because again, a lot of the, like when I look around me, I mean, everyone is white and even my, the administrators within the school are white. So it kind of, I don't wanna say that kind of like subconsciously, um, just kind of made me feel a little more, I guess, alone in a sense, just because when I look around me, you know, no one really looks like me and I couldn't necessarily relate to anyone. And then not only that, but also being transgender, that played a huge role in it because I think at the time I was the only transgender individual within my whole school. So it's like being, being black and then also being transgender, being the only transgender person in your school and then also going through what I went through you know, within athletics, I think, even though, again, my, my kind of community was very supportive, at the same time, it was very just kind of just isolated because I didn't have anyone necessarily to relate to, um, especially that first year, my freshman year of high school, because I know Terry had come out and ran, I think, my our sophomore year. So my freshman year, I really didn't have anyone. And it just, I think it made things a little, I mean, really made things a little harder because I, didn't really have anyone to kind of talk to. And, you know, when Terry had come up, had come along, it just made everything a lot, a lot easier. I was able to kind of like just lift it a lift it away off of my shoulders because I was able to talk to Terry and kind of get some of my thoughts and get some of my feelings about what we both were going through. We're kind of like able to juggle them back and forth with one another and be like, oh you know, someone had done this and that, I didn't like how that felt, or this happened to me, did, did you have to go through the same thing? And not only really sharing our experience in that way, like kind of like, I guess, kind of like swapping them in a sense, but also her helping me, me helping her, because I remember the first time Terry had reached out to me, she had asked me, she was like, you know, how were you able to run track as a female? Like, you know, what steps did you take in order to do so? And you know, I told her the steps and I think in that sense, in that way, we also help each other just kind of, I think, be where we both are now. And I mean, I know that, you know, without her help and without her support, um, you know, I think, you know, me now would be very different. And I think that, I mean, my whole, my experience as a whole throughout high school would be very different, you know, without her support. And then not only, not only really within my school, within my community, I guess my immediate community, but as you mentioned, through social media, through social media, um, I think my own community social media were very drastically different. Like as we had mentioned, again, my school and I guess my family with me being trans have been have been very supportive, but over the internet, a lot of people didn't, I mean, didn't agree with what I was doing and what Terry and I were doing. And with people not agreeing came a lot of just a lot of criticism. And I think it's more like just really kind of just kind of hatred, and I think well maybe really just bigotry and ignorance. Um, you know that Terry and I had dealt with. I mean, constantly, like almost every day, there's a new comment or you know a new direct message of someone saying, "Oh, like you shouldn't be running," or you know what you're doing is unfair. And I think you know more than I like to admit, I think what we were saying about the really took a toll kind of on my overall mental health, my overall well-being. Um, 
and I don't really know if I really kind of, I mean, as we said, I really handled it, I mean, in the best way. I think what I tried to do was, you know, kind of like ignore it and focus on, you know, the positive, focus on my friends and family, which helped throughout high school. But I think because I did all of that, I wasn't able to necessarily really process, you know, what I was going to process my emotions because I was just, you know, constantly go, 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 constantly just, you know, like it was just, I think it all happened very quickly. And I don't think I was able to necessarily process, you know, what I went through and process my real feelings by what people were saying. Because I mean, I don't think I really had time to. Like I was always in media and always like speaking out in favor of trans athletes. And I feel like I always had to put on like kind of kind of be strong for you know those who were looking up to me and those who were going through the same that I was going through. But I definitely do think, you know, my school administration in regards to me being trans, in regards to me, me running as a female on the ch chat team, I think they really did a great job with just being there for me. And I even remember, I think it was in the it was before my freshman year had started. Um, we all had like a meeting, we all sat down. It was me, the principal, vice principal, athletic director, track coaches. We all had sat down at a meeting, and we just they were kind of like, okay, Andrea, like, what do you need from us? You know, like what do you need for us to make, you know, you most comfortable within our school for the next four years? And I think that really set a tone and set a precedent for kind of how, you know, the next four years would be a, um, in high school. And I mean, I couldn't be more thankful of how they went about leaving kids me running. And I think, you know, for other schools, you know, within the state, I mean, even within the nation at that, I think they could, you know, take some notes from like what my school did and just how, again, overall, just how supportive and willing they were to, I mean, be there for me. And they were like, I mean, no matter what, Andrea, like, you know, I was going to be there. They even made sure to have my correct pronouns, make sure this, um, other teachers said Andrea and not my birth name. And just li little things like that really helped to make me feel, again, most comfortable, you know, within the school. Andre, you, you hit on uh, you hit on a lot of stuff there, and again, I think emphasizing that um, you know being able to to find ways that we can be in touch um, with our our students, and then help our students be in touch with their own emotions. But one of the aha moments that I've had since since I've had the opportunity to to work and speak with you is reflect on some of my my own practices and and even things within the schools where I was a principal of looking at, you know, what we put in place to help support LGBTQ plus students and minority students. And when I'm honest in that self-reflection, I find the actions we took were, were probably as much, if not more, where it made, you know, made me feel good or looking at non-transgender kids or non-minority kids and what makes them feel okay uh, as much as it was about, you know, trying to help the uh, a transgender student, an LGBTQ student, or a, um, you know, mi minority student. So when your administrators, your coaches in Cromwell sat down with you and said, Andrea, what do you need? Again, that's one of the aha moments I had where when we're creating these policies, whether it's we're looking at racial justice or gender uh, identity and, and bringing that together, we need to put the focus on what makes that student comfortable, what elevates that student. So when you answer that question and reflecting back now for the administrators here who, again, we, we, we may not have that many students in our schools. So answer that question for those students and for your peers there. As a transgender African-American student, what do you need and what can we provide to your peers who are like you uh, to help them be successful in our school environments? Yeah, um, I think um, I think what most of trans individuals need, I mean, maybe um, a lot of like, I guess, marginalized communities is just understanding and like willingness to understand. I know that, I mean, a lot of people just don't necessarily just really not have the access and not have the resources to really like delve into, you know, what it means to be trans or what it means 
to be Black, African American. So I think a really big thing is just awareness about, you know, who you, those communities that you want to help. Because, I mean, it would be kind of difficult to help someone you don't really understand, you know, who they are, what they went through, their experiences, and things like culture and things like that. So I think what my school did really well with was just taking the time to educate themselves on the trans community and on, again, like what it means to be trans. And not only just what it means to be trans within athletics, but kind of what it means to be trans like by itself in its own kind of entity. And just, and just really taking the time to understand and not just kind of be like, oh, you're trans, like, oh, okay, like whatever. Just they, they really took the time, sat with me, had conversations about, you know, how I wanted to be addressed, how I wanted to be perceived. And I think that really, really helped, so again, to make me feel most at home within my school. So I really think just taking the initiative to, you know, go to that trans individual, just learning from, really, whether it be from them themselves or from whatever resources you can find on the internet and just really learning from them and using what you have learned to just, you know, help them as much as you can as much as possible. Oh, I think you're, I think you're muted. Thank you, Andre. Got to do that once in every Zoom presentation. Uh, we're going to transition uh, for uh, quickly uh, over to, to Peter uh, now and, and build on, Andre, what you just said. And, and, you know, I think the way that we can start that within our schools, again, let's educate ourselves and have a good understanding of what our Connecticut laws say. And how do we develop policies that align with our Connecticut laws to at least create the structure where now we can have those meaningful conversations and create those experience for kids. And then after that, we'll have time for some questions and answers for Andrea, Peter, and myself. Uh, Peter, where are we in Connecticut? What do our laws say uh, both here and then nationally uh, with you know, Title VII, Title IX, gender identity, and how do we prepare our schools uh, to, to be ready to do this in a meaningful way for kids. Sure, thanks, Glenn. Uh, you can hear me, right? Um, all right, and uh, Glenn did a, a great job uh, highlighting, you know, some of the key uh, uh, laws and, and things you need to consider. You can tell Glenn and I have been spending a lot of time together <laughs> because he has a firm understanding of, of, of where we are. And, and look, we're here in Connecticut. We... Um, our law is more advanced than most of the country and uh, including the federal government, right? I mean, Glenn uh, identified a couple statutes that you should be aware of. And I would also direct your attention to 10-15C and that also was changed in 2011. And uh, the statute's called discrimination in public schools prohibited. And it specifically says that each child shall have an equal opportunity to participate in the activities, programs, and courses of study offered in the public schools without discrimination on account of several categories, including gender identity and expression. And so that's been the law here in Connecticut since 2011. And, and there were some um, you know, guidance and, and documents put out by Governor Moy and then the, the State Department of Education. And, and that's, that's been in place here for a long time. Now, as Glenn mentioned, you know, the federal government um, has been a little bit over all over, uh, a little bit shifting sands over the last you know eight years or so in 2016 in 2017 OCR and the Department of uh, Education came out with some guidance that affirmed that um, a school generally must treat transgender students consistent with their gender identity right um, and that was in 2015 and 16 in 2017 there was a, a slight change where um, that guidance with, was withdrawn, but it wasn't replaced with anything. And they said, you know, we're going to defer to the states and the local education, lo local education um, authorities. So that was fine because here in Connecticut, right, like I said, we had laws that protect students. And um, 2017, there was a, uh, or 2020 rather, there, there was a, a, some guidance issued um, by OCR um, that was presenting a contrary um, uh, position, but that, that has been withdrawn by the Biden administration. And as Glenn teed up for you, you know, that notice of interpretation that was issued in, in July, uh, June rather of 2021 really uh, is pretty clear that OCR 
is going to interpret um, Title IX in a manner that um, recognizes that uh, gender identity is a protect is, is is protected, right? Um, and it would be unlawful to discriminate against someone on the basis of their gender identity. Now they're not writing on a, a blank slate. Like I said, there's the, you know a lot of guidance from mostly on the past that was similar. There's the Grimm case. There's case out of California or Oregon rather involving bathrooms. There's um, a recent district court case out of Idaho that struck down some Idaho legislation aimed at uh, transgender students. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of cases that support OCR's uh, current position and certainly um, cases that, uh, you know, support Connecticut's law as well and, and Connecticut's position. So, you know, big picture, you always have to consider state law and federal law right now, you know, they're, um, they're matching up. Connecticut has strong protections in favor of uh, uh, transgender students, as well as uh, now the federal law, as well. So, um, you know, it, all of your schools and all of your 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 districts will have uh, ample policies on anti discrimination, right? I'm sure all of those have been updated um, to include gender identity and expression. If not, they should be right, uh, as well as student handbooks and the like, and and then. Um, ultimately, it, hopefully, uh, what the law encourages is exactly what Andrea kind of went through, you know, with schools recognizing that, meeting with students, what do you need coming up for, with, with, a, with a program that works when, when students are either um, arriving in a school district or arrived and then uh, are transitioning while they're in a school district, right? How is that going to be handled? I think a lot of schools have policies and procedures in place that address that and, um, uh, already, but if not, it's something um, that, sh that should be looked at and, and prepared for. So, you know, big picture, um, uh, that's where we stand with Connecticut and federal law. And I know, you know, we're running short on time, so I don't want to <laughs> get into too much detail on those, but um, that's, that's generally speaking where the law stands. Peter, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, you know, Bill, at this time, we're happy to uh, open up to any uh, questions from the participants. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Longarini, Mr. Murphy, and Ms. Yearwood for that presentation. And there is some time uh, for questions. Uh, if folks uh, either want to put a question in the chat or we're, we're a small enough group, uh, you could unmute yourself and and uh, ask your question. So um, we have uh, about uh, seven or eight minutes uh, for questions uh, before I have a, a, a short wrap up um, before we have to close. Uh, any comments, questions? Um, so we do have one. How does this apply to non-binary students, especially in regards to uh, legal aspects uh, and in uh, athletics. So any guidance on, on that uh, from, from the experts? Yes, and you know, I think um, we could, uh, we can kind of attack this from, you know, all three of us uh, a little bit, but we'll start with Peter and then Andre, I'll come back to you to, you know, just kind of talk about a little bit of this as well. But, you know, when we uh, look at nine binary, again, we anticipate that uh, we eventually will get this question. Again, we are collecting data statewide now and through the State Department of Education on non-binary students as a uh, classification. So, you know, we do anticipate that uh, coming. And, you know, Peter, as we consider um, the aspect of, of non-binary, there are things um, within our experiences that, that do have a, a binary nature to it. So, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to create a non-binary, um, you know, sport classification because there, there just aren't enough kids to do it. It's the similar argument we've heard of why don't you just create a transgender classification for kids to compete in. So for the purpose of sport, um, we would need to consider um, how we include non-binary kids where they would need to uh, choose a gender for participation, but then also be cognizant of the gender fluidity nature of our laws to make sure we're in compliance with that. Peter? Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense, right? Sports is, is 
I think you got to look at it from two different angles, right? One um, in the within the school and, and issues such as how they'll be referred to, what bathrooms to use, things of that nature, right? Um, which might change over the course of a year. But then sports are a little different because you have set rosters and, and set times for people to, to join your team, et cetera. And, and uh, I guess, you know, I'll have to give the lawyer's favorite answer, right? It depends. <laughs> I just, it, things are fluid, I guess, right now, right? And, and, and the law can be a little slow to catch up to some side uh, changes, uh, societal changes. And, and, um, and so I, I'm not, I don't think I'm aware of any cases specifically addressing this situation. Um, but it, so I think you're, when presented with it, you'll, you, as always, go back to your policies, as always, you know, meet with the student and, and, and the affected um, staff members, coaches, whatever it is, and, and see how you can best come up with a plan to address the situation. I think that's really the best advice we can give right now. And if, um, you know, if you have a specific case, you can always reach out to you, to CAS and CIC. You can reach out to me and we can help you, you know, walk through the process and uh, of how to have those conversations as well. And, you know, Andrea, along those lines, um, just create a transgender category. Just create a non-binary category. That's not the answer because? Well, there aren't enough and it, it wouldn't really be a team and you don't want to be competing against like yourself and one other person. Um, and I feel like also to your point, I feel like saying, oh, just create a different team. I feel like that's even more isolating to those um, non-binary or transgender individuals because you're essentially just saying like, oh, you're other than, you know, these male, female, and you're just other. So we're gonna just like, kind of just like push you off to the side, you do whatever you want, we don't really care. Um, but yes, I think that, I mean, as you said, oh, Peter, uh, I think it just depends on like, look at your past um, policies. And I think also it kind of depends on the person itself. I mean, obviously, because being non-binary is very, I think, broad terms, and a lot can go under that. So I think depending on the, um, the kid and like, you know, what they want, what, what they want, what they feel like they need in that moment, I also, I think it's very big factor and, you know, making those policies make them feel comfortable. Andrea, we have a question about um, dead naming. And, you know, so you had mentioned how, you know, Cromwell really embraced um, not calling you by your birth name. So, you know, and um, Marie, if you want to, you know, go deeper into what you're looking for there, but can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, about that um, phenomenon and, and, you know, the importance of addressing a person um, by the name which they choose to identify with. Okay, yeah. So um, I think I think the transition was fairly smooth because, I mean, in middle school, I went by my dead name, but then in high school, um, I had changed my name and I went by Andrea. And I mean, for, my, for me, it was very smooth. I mean, I think it really helped because it was a different school. So, well, same, I guess, town, but like different school with different people in the building. So they didn't really know my dead name. So it kind of made the change a lot easier because this was kind of the first they were, I guess, addressing me. So they didn't have to before so they didn't know who I was. But um, I think, I mean, I really, it's really important because, I mean, it's your name, it's what people call you. And I know that for a lot of people, their name, I mean, it's a big significance to like, kind of like who you are. I mean, in a lot of cultures, naming, like, I mean, it's just for me, in my culture, I'm Nigerian, and my grandfather had named all of us, me and my siblings, <clears throat> excuse me, based on kind of like our birth, because my dead name in my, uh, I guess, culture means strength. And I had gone through a lot in my birth, so he put a lot of thought and a lot of kind of just I guess not like, like emphasis on my name because it was like a lot of importance on it. But I know naming and someone's name means a lot to them. So and I just feel like I mean some calling someone their name is very important, especially if you're trans, non-binary, and I feel like if you chose your name yourself, I feel like it's even more important to call them by their name. And I feel like just dead naming is very disrespectful. And I mean, 
it's not their name, so why call something that they're not? And that's, that doesn't, you know, resonate with them. Not just disrespectful, but can lead to illegal behavior, right? Discriminatory behavior that's going to open up a school district uh, to liability. And, and you know, on the the kind of a national listserv of uh, education attorneys, and um, there's been a lot of questions about this recently about teacher or administrators refusing to call a student by his or her name, right? And using a dead name and vice versa, students doing it to the teachers and, and how that disciplinary process plays out and, and how it intersects with the, the First Amendment. So um, it is, I think, gonna be a, 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 an issue, but it's one that needs to be taken care of because it can certainly lead to harassment. Thing, okay? so, so yeah. I have to interrupt, unfortunately, and stop things there. We're on a pretty tight uh, timeline uh, in order to uh, close things out and let people get on to the next breakout. But I really do want to thank our speakers uh, today. You've given us a lot to think about and reflect on uh, and to help us, uh, you know, improve the educational experience for all students uh, in our school communities.